Father, we praise you. We praise you that you called our name. That you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to pay it all. To pay the ultimate price. So that we could be set free. So that the anxiety and the fear and the worry and the the bitterness and the anger and all the sin that, that weighed us down, Lord, you have removed it. And that we receive grace through faith. That you have now given us your spirit. You have now given us a new life. You've now given us a new reason for living. And it doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean we don't struggle. It means that you are the answer. That you're the provider. And that you are our peace. And so we come into your presence and we ask, Lord God, that your word would open our hearts and minds. And by the power of your spirit, you would speak truth to us. That we could continue to walk out the transformed life that you have given us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We continue a series called I Do, and it's about marriage, but it's also about relationship, any relationship, really. And what happens is, uh, as we go through Scripture, sometimes we, we uh, chop it up into verses. And so you get into Ephesians 5, and it says, Husbands, love your wives, and wives, uh, submit to your husbands. And the women go, What? You know, <laughs> and so we, we, we have these couple of verses, but here's what you need to know. Paul did not write a letter. How many of you write a letter with chapter numbers? Nobody writes a letter with chapter one. Dear, you know, you don't do that, right? And so we place the chapter breaks in there. And so what that does is sometimes it creates an unnecessary break in the flow of thought. And when you have an unnecessary break in the flow of thought, sometimes you miss not only the what, but the how. All right? So we're going to look at this idea at the conclusion of Ephesians 5 that says, you know, love. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. All right? This is the mystery. I'm talking about Christ and his church. Now, we got the, the bottom part, but now we got to trace it all the way back up to figure out how do we do that? Right? I mean, that's the, that's the real million-dollar question. Okay, I get it. That's what I'm supposed to do. How do I do that? Okay, that's what we're going to talk about today, about being in the relationship zone. How many of you have ever seen a slinky? Right? All right. Did you know that the inventor for the slinky was actually trying to make an appliance stabilizer? All right, back in the early days of appliances, they, you know, they rattled around. And so he, he made this spring, and he was going to fix and stabilize appliances. And he, he brought a prototype home, and his kids started playing with it. And he had another brilliant idea. And it became known as the Slinky. You guys are familiar with Play-Doh? Its original intent was wallpaper cleaner. Again, can you just imagine the engineer that created that coming home, and he's showing his wife uh, real proudly, and she gets hold of it and says, oh, this stuff is cool. <laughs> you know. And then another, another idea is born. A 3M engineer was trying to make a really strong adhesive, and he had prototype after prototype. And one, he found it, when it stuck, he could peel it up, and it would leave no residue. Gave birth to the Post-it note. Its intent was something completely different. What has happened is, in our culture, God's intent for marriage has been totally lost and turned into a plaything. The plaything is, make me happy. Oh, she makes me happy. Oh, he makes me so happy. She meets my needs. He meets my needs. And we've turned it in to something that God never intended. Now, it doesn't mean that a marriage shouldn't have some of that in there. It should, but that is not its primary purpose. And if you try to make it that its primary purpose, you are for sure to be unhappy. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. Not only are you going to be unhappy, but you also are led to a false logic. Because they no longer make me happy, because they no longer meet my need, because they no longer make my socks go up and down, I must no longer be in love, therefore, I must no longer be married. That's the faulty logic that we as Christians have adopted and inherited from the world. And God says, 
Marriage is designed to reflect the gospel message of Christ Jesus. Paul says a mystery. He's talking about men and women in 528. And then he says, he switches it up on us. He says, I tell you, this is a mystery. This is really about Christ and his church. What he's saying is your marriage is to reflect the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5, 32 and 33. This is a profound mystery. He has just been talking about husbands love your wives. Wives respect your husbands. He says, this is a profound mystery. I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. These two verses are conjoined together. That the spousal relationship is to be a picture of the gospel message. Now think about that for a minute. What did Jesus come to do for the bride of Christ? He left heaven. <laughs> it's pretty good up there. He was born in a barn to a construction worker. And then his dad died when he was little. And then he grew up with no place to lay his head, for three years did ministry, and then they nailed him to a cross. That is the picture of marriage. Does that sound like fun to you? That's a joke. I mean, y'all, y- 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 come on. Some of you are like, way, that's way too accurate. All right. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that Jesus didn't have joy, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. It just means he went into it with a sacrificial love mindset. Not about me, 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 but let me lay down my life that you might experience reconciled love. That's the picture of marriage. But before we get there, we've got to go all the way back. I want to take you back to Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. All right? So here's the thing. Well, let's go on. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. If you have confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your Savior, what Scripture says is you've exchanged your life for the life of Christ. Now, Jesus comes to live in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, you have been sealed. Not, I mean, not that, okay? But think of a signet ring. Back in the the old days, uh, they would take wax and they would pour it on a piece of paper and then they would stamp the sign of the king, sealed. This is the picture. You have been stamped. If you possess the Holy Spirit of God, you are stamped for the day of redemption. You are redeemed presently and one day you will be redeemed, okay? Okay? So what he's saying here, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Okay, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. You can grieve and quench the Holy Spirit. Grieving the Holy Spirit is doing things that you ought not do. Quenching the Holy Spirit is not doing things you ought to do. Have you ever felt like the Holy Spirit nudged you to do something? You're like, I'm not doing that. That's quenching the Holy Spirit. It's putting the fire out. Grieving the Holy Spirit is when you... Do the thing that you know you're not supposed to do. What is that? He says this. Get rid. Now, think about relationships here. Get rid of all bitterness. Are you bitter towards someone? Rage. Come on, man. It's as green as it gets. Go. You know. (laughs) Anger. Brawl. Slander. Some of you... You use that as a prayer request. Let's just pray for her because, and then slander starts. In every form of malice, the contrast to that is be kind and compassionate toward one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you, just as. This is the picture of marriage As Christ loved the church, he's saying you need to love this way. Now, this works in any relationship. Forgive just as. Our marriages should be full of grace. Unforgiveness is a cancer 
in a relationship. It is a cancer in a marriage. Forgiveness is the ultimate key. Christ has forgiven us, and so just as Christ forgave you, you forgive one another. Embitteredness and anger, kind of just a whatever attitude in marriage, is a killer. It goes something like this. I want to change you. 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 You're not going to change. You're not going to change. You're not going to change. Forget it. I have no expectation that they're ever going to change. I've tried. Your job is not to tra- change them. Beep, 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 beep. Newsflash. Your job is not to change the person you are married to. Your job is to submit and surrender to the Holy Spirit of God and have him change you, fill you up with the attributes of the Spirit of God and love in this way that is amazing and let God do the same thing. And then, well, I tried that and that didn't work. Well, how's the other working for you? Uh-huh, that's what I thought. Unforgiveness is a cancer. One of my friends... Uh, we went on a mission trip together years ago, and she was estranged from her husband. She had moved out, in fact, living in an apartment, chose not to divorce, but just unhappy, unfulfilled. And she was listening to this series I preached over at the other campus, and she was listening online, and she called me one day and said, Pastor Jeff, I'm going home. And I said, what? She said, yeah, I've been listening to your sermon series online, and I think God wants me to go home. And she moved back in with her husband. She called her husband, can I move back in? He said, yeah. She moved back in with her husband. And I almost lost it last weekend when I saw them sitting together in the marriage conference. God softened her heart. When she was obedient, she went home and softened his heart. That's how it works. That's how it works. When we begin to obey, when we begin to follow, and so you're going to see this in this passage. He says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Forgive one another. And then Paul says in Ephesians 5, be imitators of me and walk in the light. Okay? So first thing, relationship zone, if you're going to have a successful marriage, it's anchored in spirit-filled compassion. You have to have the spirit controlling. You have to have compassion. You have to have a heart of forgiveness. But the second thing is, you have to have a spirit-filled walk. He says, walk in the light as I am in the light. Find out what pleases the Lord. Be very careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. We should display a walk of unity, a walk that gives light. And this is the virtuous cycle that my friend experienced when she didn't grieve the Holy Spirit, when she obeyed the Holy Spirit, she started walking in the light. And when the light comes in on her, she begins to experience that virtuous cycle. Light begets light. But what happens is we choose to walk in darkness sometimes because we grieve the Holy Spirit. Some friends of mine, I did their wedding 20-something years ago. If you were to see them, they would be the prototypical couple that everyone would look at and go, oh, wow, they have it all. Beautiful kids, great business, multimillionaire. Um, They just had it all. But what the problem was is he had an insecurity and she had discontent. These two do not go well together. He was insecure that even though his company was super successful, even though he had millions of dollars and his kids had everything, the best schools, everything. He had never gone to college. Some of you are thinking, I would trade my degree for his business. That's what we're all thinking. But in his mind, he was just not enough. He had insecurity. Well, she was always discontent. Well, yeah, you make millions of dollars and we have a great house and our kids are good to the best schools and we go to church and you're this, that, and the other. But... But, there was always a but, it was never enough. And so you put those two things together, and instead of being a virtuous cycle of walking in the light and building one another up with love and compassion, it was a vicious cycle of tearing one another down. And their marriage ended a year ago. Which direction is your relationship headed? You see... If there's anxiety or fear, greed or anger, resentment, jealousy, self-righteousness, discontent, insecurity, these things are seeds that we're 
bear malignant fruit. Forgive one another just as I have forgiven you. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit by walking in that selfishness and that bitterness. Walk in the light. Third thing is this, this lifestyle is expressed by following the will of God. In Ephesians 5, 17, he says, don't be foolish. Understand what the Lord's will is. What the Lord's will is. Hinge, this is a hinge sentence here. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Let me, let me paraphrase this for you to smooth this out. Because some people like to get hung up on little things. See, it says there, you're not supposed to get drunk on wine. And you get stuck there, but you miss the context. The point is this. Do not be controlled by any external substance or any internal factor, but be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. What fills you controls you. If Netflix fills you, Netflix controls you. If porn fills you, porn controls you. If shopping fills you, shopping controls you. All right? He says, don't get controlled by anything else, but allow the Holy Spirit of God to control your life. That's how you know what the will of the Lord is. People are going, well, oh, Pastor, I, 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 can you tell me if it's God's will for me to divorce my... No! There's some things you don't need to pray about. Should I steal this car? No! You don't need to pray about that. But there are other things that are more difficult. And this is where you need an active relationship with the Holy Spirit of God. This is the most undertaught, under understood aspect of the Christian walk. People think if they just be pretty good and go to church and read their Bible every now and then, um, that, you know, they're pretty, and go to life group, and then I went on a mission trip, and I, I checked all the boxes. Welcome to the Old Testament. It's not about what you do. The New Testament is about why you do it. I do it because the Holy Spirit of God is in me and he is leading me. I have a relationship with him and this is his will that I go on a mission trip and this is his will that I serve at VBS and this is his will. I don't do it out of compulsion, guilt, or obligation to try to be good enough to earn God's merit. I do it because the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of me and just like Jesus did what he heard his father say, I only do what I hear my father saying. Jesus says, this is the life I came to give you. And some of you have never been taught that you can hear and discern the voice of God. His voice will always be consistent with his word. In fact, the word of God and the spirit of God are designed to go together. Jesus says, I'm going to send you my spirit and he will remind you of everything that I have told you. Have you ever put Mentos in a three liter bottle of soda? It's so cool. Go home and do this if you haven't. If you put a sleeve of Mentos in a three-liter bottle of soda, it will shoot 30 feet in the air. It's super cool. Do it with your kids. Someplace where the sticky won't get. But it's a, called a chemical reaction. And this is the way the Word of God and the Spirit of God come together. So if you're trying to get through life as a Christian without the Word of God, it is the single most important factor in your growing in discipleship. But it's always in conjunction with the Spirit of God. In the Spirit of God, you can learn to hear his voice. If you can grieve him and be filled by him, you're expected to have an ongoing relationship with him. The other night I woke up. I'm at that age where I got to go a couple times to the boys' room in the middle of the night. But I woke up and went, and I came back, and I was laying in bed, and... I couldn't go to sleep. My mind started spinning. I was anxious. And so I did what I do. And um, I practiced different forms of spiritual disciplines. But uh, what I did that night is I laid in my bed and I'm, my thoughts are going everywhere. And I just said, Our Father. I started with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father was as far as I got. Our Father. 
About that time, my wife's hand came over and put it on my chest. I grabbed her hand. I said, our Father. Our. About that time, I thought about my dad calling me right before I went to bed. Praying for you, son. We're not going to be there tomorrow, but I'm praying for you like I do every day. I love you. And I thought, our Father. I've got a Father who loves me. And I never got to who our dad, but I went to sleep. I practiced that prayer. I practiced, the Lord is my shepherd. And I get in certain times, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall I want. I practiced the Jesus prayer in Luke 18. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. I have worn that prayer out at certain seasons in my life. And what it does is it redirects my thoughts off of the carnage of my world. And it directs my thoughts to him. And that's the way I kind of trigger myself to say, Holy Spirit of God, what are you up to? Help me to focus in on you. Help me to hear your voice. Help me discern what you're up to right now. You can hear and know and be an ongoing minute-by-minute relationship with the Holy Spirit of God. And that is the life that Christ came to offer you. And your marriage is impossible without it. The final thing he says is this. Not only is it expressed by following God's will. If you're going to follow God's will, you've got to know his will. If you've got to know his will, you've got to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. It looks like, here's what it looks like. It looks like mutual submission. Ephesians 5, 19, 21. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Who does this? Only people who are controlled by the Spirit. What are you saying, Pastor Jeff? Do I have to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs? Like to my spouse, or how, what did that kind of looks awkward? And songs are sung in different ways. We ran into a couple at a restaurant a few weeks back, and we were coming out of the west restaurant, and they were coming in. And I don't know how old this guy was, but he was pushing 90. He was bent over like an accordion and a, had a hearing thing in his head, and he was walking like this. And she was doting along right behind him, and I opened the door for him. And he said, hey, is this a good place to eat? I said, it is a great place to eat. You're going to enjoy it. He said, "Uh, good, because she's hungry, and she's just got to be fed. (laughs) And the people over at the hotel said, this is a good place, but I want to make sure. And I said, yes, sir. And so we started talking to him. And as he talked, he did all the talking. And as he talked, she smiled and just looked at him adoringly, like, he is so cute. And he went on and on, talked about her and where they're from, and this, that, and the other. And then they went in. We closed the door. We're walking to the car. And my youngest daughter looks at me and says, Aw, Daddy, can we get one of them? <laughs> like they're a puppy or something, you know what I mean? But what, what it was is he's singing. He's singing. They love each other. 90s, and they're still in love. And it's a song. It's a spiritual song that's just flowing out of their relationship. And what Scripture says is this, that that we should have mutual submission out of reverence to Christ. In other words, we should have the sacrificial love of Christ evident in our relationship. And it should be a virtuous cycle, not one that tears down, but one that builds up. And it's a song coming out of our life, and it's a song of the gospel that when people look at your marriage, when they look at your relationships, they see Jesus. You know beauty when you see it, don't you? What is your relationship saying to the world? Your marriage starts and stops with the Holy Spirit of God. So let's reverse it. Okay, you ready? Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. How do I do that? You discern what the Lord's will is. How do I do that? You're filled with the Holy Spirit of God. 
how do I do that? You walk in the light and obey the Holy Spirit by not grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit by doing the things you know you ought not do. Let's go forward. Moving forward. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Rather, walk in the light. As you walk in the light, you are filled with the Spirit of God. As you're filled with the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God begins to emanate out of you, and the proof of that is that you submit to one another out of reverence for Jesus. You want to know how to have a successful relationship? You try this. Try this at work. Try this at home. Try this with your kids. Try this with your in-laws. Whoever, try this. Spirit of God, I submit to you. I surrender to you. And I will obey. I'll walk in the light. And as you experience that, fullness will come over you. It'll change your actions. It'll change your behaviors. It will restore and heal your marriage. You've got to quit trying to control somebody else and submit to Jesus. If you don't have the Holy Spirit of God in you, you know it. Because scripture says, my spirit testifies to your spirit that you're a child of God. If you don't have an understanding of who the spirit of God is, you're not a child of God. The way that you do that is you submit and surrender your life to Jesus. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. I want to follow you and I want to receive your spirit. That's called getting saved. Once you do that, then you can begin to live the life that he's called you to live. And that's what marriage is about. You can't have a good marriage if one of you has the Spirit of God and one of you doesn't. You want to know what the will of God is? Receive his Spirit, follow his word. When you step out of line with the Spirit of God, you grieve the Spirit of God. If you do that long enough, you'll become numb to his voice. You'll no longer experience conviction. If you get back in line with God by understanding his word, submitting to the Holy Spirit of God, this is the life that you were called to live. We're going to take the Lord's Supper here in a moment. The Lord's Supper is an affirmation, confirmation of the new covenant. The old covenant, Moses' Ten Commands. Keep these and it will be well with you. That's the old covenant. Jesus says, I came to fulfill it and to set it aside. Doesn't mean it's irrelevant. It means it's fulfilled. All right? That is, do this, do that, do this, do that, and you can have a relationship with me. He says, now there's a new covenant, not based on what you do, but based on what I have done. I've laid down my life and I've shed my blood that whoever believes in me will receive the Holy Spirit of God and can live in a new way. That's the new covenant. Old covenant was signed by circumcision. Passover. New covenant is baptism and the Lord's Supper. And there's one command that goes in the new covenant. A new command I give to you. Love one another. Agape love, just as I have loved you. Love one another. And the only way that you can do that is by the power of the Holy Spirit that he gives you when you're ushered in. And so here's what we're going to do this morning. If you've never received Jesus as your Savior, you've never received the Holy Spirit right now where you are, what you must do is to confess to him your great need for him. Your sin has separated you from God. And say, I don't have you. I don't have life. I need you. Jesus, be my Savior. I accept you. I give you my life. I want you to be in control. I want to receive your spirit. I want to walk in the light. I want to live. And when you do that, Scripture calls born again. And the reason they say born again is because you've received the spirit of God in you. If you've already done that, And yet you've grieved the Holy Spirit, but certain behaviors and actions and attitudes. You come to him in this moment and you just surrender and say, Holy Spirit of God, I surrender. I submit. I give you my life. Fill me. Give me wisdom. Show me how to walk. Show me where you would lead me. I watched people in the first service as we went through this time wrestle with God. They heard the Holy Spirit and they were like, oh, I don't want to do that. 
trust me, when the Spirit of God speaks, that is the grace and love and kindness of Jesus leading you on a path of righteousness. Follow him. As the plates are passed, please take both cups. On the top is the juice. Underneath that is the cracker. As it's passed, James is going to sing this song. And as he sings this song, you use this time to talk to Jesus. Holy Spirit of God, I want to hear your voice. I want to know your voice. Holy Spirit of God, lead me. Bring peace to my marriage. Bring forgiveness. Bring compassion. Take away anger. You deal with Jesus so that he can give you the love that you need for others. As we prepare to take the Lord's Supper this morning, if there's someone here this morning and you said, Pastor Jeff, today's the day that I gave my life to Jesus. I want to receive the Holy Spirit. See, communion is for the born again. It's to remember Jesus. And if you gave your life to Christ this morning, would you just let us celebrate by raising your hand? Anybody here for the first time? Okay. Anybody else? We welcome you, sister, into our community, into the body of Christ, the body of Christ. Jesus met with his disciples the night he was betrayed. It was Passover. And he transformed the Passover meal that was about leaving Egypt and he transformed it into something new. He took the bread and he broke it. He said, this represents my body that's going to be sacrificed for you. Whenever you take of this, remember me. And then he took the cup of wine. There would have been seven cups of wine at a traditional Passover meal, and he took the final one, and they would have passed it around, and he drank from it. And he said, this cup represents the new covenant. Now, you have to understand how profound this would have been to 12 Jewish guys. This is the new covenant, the new contract, the new agreement. It's not about the tablets of stone and the rules. This new covenant is in my blood. Whenever you drink of this cup, remember what I've done for you. Remember that I laid my life down so that you could have life. Love, forgive, serve, surrender, just as your relationships are a picture of the gospel to the world. Father, it's Father's Day. We are so grateful for the Father who loves us in ways that we cannot perceive, conceive, or imagine. And by your grace, by your grace, Lord God, you don't hold anything against us. You, you forgive and you show love and mercy and compassion and, and you give us the capacity to do the same. So Lord Jesus, find us not trying and striving in our own strength. Find us submitted and surrendered and filled by your power and your goodness and your good pleasure that we might love one another well so that the world will know. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.